To Capitol Hill now. Democrats are racing to reach agreements on President Biden's agenda before he travels to Europe later on this week. Moderates and progressives are still clashing over certain provisions in the president's social spending bill and infrastructure plan. And this comes as the White House works to convince lawmakers that for now they may have to make concessions in order to move forward. Compromise. What a novel idea. Ed O'Keefe is at the White House with the very latest. So, Ed, um, uh, we know that there are two sort of Democratic senators that have been really kind of holding things up a bit. But I think the one that has probably caused President Biden to pop a few aspirants here and there is probably Senate, uh, Senator Kirsten, uh, Kirsten Sinema, uh, primarily because she seems to be the one that uh, knows clearly what she doesn't want, but not so clearly what she does want. Um, but the president met with her yesterday. He also met with a number of House members. Do we know what has co come out of those meetings? Well, and so, first of all, I think we should send you in to talk to Democrats about compromise, because they could use the pep talk right now, it seems. <laughs> Second, um, not only was Senator Sinema here last night, but so was Senator Manchin. The two moderate holdouts that really are the cog in the system right now. Democrats all waiting for the two of them to say signal what it is they're for or against, as this president, a former senator, has made clear to his party the Senate is a body right now where all 50 Democratic senators are needed and need to be on board, and therefore we have to wait for them. Uh, what did that yield? Well, among other things, it yielded a public statement of support from Senator Sinema for the new global uh, corporate minimum tax, uh, which would essentially set a, a minimum rate at which corporations uh, of a massive size, essentially, would have to pay taxes, saying it's, it's a fair and equitable thing to do. Manchin is also on board with that. So there. One piece of this massive, however many trillions of dollars package is now paid for, but it's not enough. There were some other elements released this morning that we're going to talk about in a second that are still up for debate. The other meeting that he held with a handful of House Democrats appeared to be mostly designed to shore up the base. What's that song? It's all about the base. It's all about the base. In this case, what he's trying to tell the most loyal right. of Democrats uh, who lead the black, Latino, Asian women and gay caucus in the House, look, Many of the things we've all pushed for are in here. It's not exactly what we campaigned on. It's not a thousand percent. But to go from zero to something on so many of these issues should be good enough for us for now. And we will continue to campaign to fulfill these pledges in the coming cycles. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, they came out and they, they cited things like, you know, funding for affordable housing, paid family leave, uh, some kind of immigration component, which is still being worked out. Uh, and, and a signal that they are unified behind the president, who they credited with helping really craft this down to the details, uh, and then sell it to his members with the intention of going out and selling it to the American public once it's passed. Um, but we're not there yet. There are still many outstanding issues that remain with a president set to leave Washington in about 25 hours for a series of meetings in Europe. White House says the phones work just fine from over there. And he's happy to work them if need be. <laughs> but they certainly would prefer to see this essentially on its way to at least a handshake and a written agreement by the time he's landing in Europe. Um, well, the corporate tax um, agreement is a good one because the president is heading off to the G20 summit where he's going to be talking about that. The other thing that he's going to uh, on his trip to Europe is a climate change, a UN global summit on climate change and the climate crisis. Um, so uh, in regards to that, lawmakers, uh, the, you know, the White House is telling uh, lawmakers that the climate change portion of the social spending package is likely to cost more than $500 billion. I'm curious about how that compares to the original cost estimate, and will this further hinder lawmakers' ability to get the bill passed? Yeah, uh, it's only about $100 billion less than originally proposed. Um, and I think part of the reason details of this leaked out yesterday was designed to sort of help buoy enthusiasm for this among the Democrats who will have to vote to approve it, and to signal to folks here in town and those watching these climate talks closely that despite the fact that the deal isn't done yet, one piece of it that's basically been put to bed is the climate component, and it's sizable. It would be the largest investment ever by the federal government in the, in the fight against climate change. It does a host of things to promote the use of certain materials or others or gets credits to companies for for using uh, more environmentally friendly building materials and such. It took out some provisions that Manchin and others from fossil fuel producing states were concerned about.
but there's still a lot there based on the agreement that they appear to have. So I think it's also part of the push by Democrats to point out that while there may be three or four or five very specific but important elements of this that aren't done yet, a big chunk of the legislation is ready to go because there appears to be near unanimous agreement among Democrats that it has to be done. That's good news. Uh, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you uh, about a little domestic politics. Uh, Biden, uh, President Biden campaigned for Terry McAuliffe in Virginia's governor's race uh, yesterday. You were at the rally. How did it go? You know, part of the reason that he's bringing out these, you know, heavyweight Democrats is he's hoping to fire up Democratic voters um, without the benefit of, you know, a Donald Trump running, which helped a lot during the presidential election, but that's not the situation now. So were there any notable moments? There were. Uh, for one thing, the current president went after the former president and raised questions about why Glenn Youngkin, the Republican, who has in the past and during the primary signaled that he supported Donald Trump, why he isn't campaigning with him. Um, and and to, to my ear, what the current president was trying to do was goad the former president into the race, get him to join the fray through his emailed statements or through some kind of media appearance to do or say something that provides just enough fodder for Democrats to turn around and say, see, that's why you don't want this guy Glenn Youngkin to win, because he's an acolyte, as they now call him, of Donald Trump and would enact Trump-like policies. There's a very interesting political strategy underway here. Democrats going sort of with the traditional bring out your big guns, all guns of all kinds and all shades to help with getting voters to the polls. That's everyone from the current president, former President Obama, the first lady, the vice president Kamala Harris, who will appear later this week at a campaign event that also features the singer Pharrell. Uh, and then people like Cory Booker and Alex Padilla, the senators who are black and Latino to help draw out certain segments of the Democratic base. But then there's Glenn Youngkin, who's traveling Virginia right now on a bus going to the most reliably Republican parts of the state, churning out the base and saying, if you can vote early, go ahead. If not, show up next Tuesday. And he's insisted, I will win this on my own. And if he does, Anne-Marie, it'll be a signal to Republicans in states where the former president isn't as popular, where he didn't win, or where just baggage from the last four years won't help you. It'll signal to them, you've got to do this on your own, and you've got to do it by raising affirmative issues of concern to voters. In this case, in Virginia, it's education. Up in New Jersey, uh, it might be issues like taxes uh, that are helping the Republican there, Jack Chiarelli, take on the uh, incumbent, Phil Murphy. But that race is looking more like the Democrats will win. But the Yunkin lesson, if he wins, will be instructive in places like North Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, where the former president may not be as popular uh, or where he could be a factor that Democrats try to use. And it'll be a lesson to the Democrats that you've got to be for something other than just raising concerns about the former president. Lots, lots, lots of time still to go, yeah. uh, but plenty of lessons will be learned from this contest. Yeah, and it, it could be also a lesson to the former president um, because, you know, he still sort of is attempting to exert some influence on the Republic, Republican Party. And so, you know, it may also indicate that his influence is, is not as strong and not yeah. as necessary. Um, Ed, we will talk more about this at some other time. Thank you so much. See you later.